It was the pre-dawn hours of May 22nd. The Atlanta Police Bureau and the FBI had been staking out bridges along the Chattahoochee River for the last two months. That morning, while four officers sat quietly under the South Cobb Drive Bridge, one of them, an Atlanta recruit, heard a splash. Several radio messages and a flurry of activity soon had a car stopped. In it was 23-year-old Wayne Williams. No arrest was made then, and no one inspected two bags of clothes, the pair of men's shoes, or the gloves seen inside the station wagon. For two days, the task force quietly dragged the river, not finding anything. Three days later, two people in a canoe did. The nude body of Nathaniel Cater, a mile downstream from the South Cobb Bridge. For the next two weeks, Wayne Williams was being watched. Police thought the surveillance was undercover. Uh, Williams says, the not so. Done. They put a tail on me uh, starting last week. I made them probably in the first hour or two. And uh, in the process of tailing me, I, uh, a couple of the guys apparently weren't very good drivers, and I caused them to have a minor accident. And I think they were just pissed. By June 3rd, task force leaders decided their surveillance had in fact been spotted. That night, they entered his home with a search warrant, confiscating bags of alleged evidence. Across town at the state crime lab, experts claimed that fibers taken from a carpet and bedspread that night matched fibers taken from the victim's head. Dog hairs taken from the family pet also matched animal hairs taken from the body. But after 12 hours of intense questioning, Wayne Williams was not arrested. We have not, nor do we intend to make an arrest. We have, as we do on many occasions, follow up and investigative leads to determine exactly where those leads ultimately takes us in terms of our efforts tonight. We have not ended up with the information that would result in an arrest. What followed was three more weeks outside the Williams home. The media watched what was later called police presence, which was watching the non-suspect around the clock. Finally, on Father's Day, a month after the bridge incident, Wayne Williams was arrested and charged with the murder of Nathaniel Cater. The Atlanta Child Murders was a series of abductions and murders of African-American children and young adults that happened between 1979 and 1981 in Atlanta, Georgia. In the summer of 1979, 14-year-old Edward Smith and 13-year-old Alfred Evans disappeared four days apart. Their bodies were found on July 28th in a wooded area. Smith suffered from a gunshot wound in his upper back. They were believed to be the first victims of the Atlanta child killer. The missing person is 14-year-old Edward Smith. Smith was last seen more than a week ago near the Greenbrier skating rink. Then yesterday, several miles from Greenbrier off Niskey Lake Road, detectives found two bodies, both young black teenage boys. One was so badly decomposed, he cannot be recognized. Today, detectives were out digging in the area, searching for further evidence, perhaps a bullet. Downtown today, Fulton County Medical Examiners John Fiegel and James Metcalf were comparing dental records with what they know about the missing Smith's teeth. Well, we're, we've got people out uh, knocking on doors trying to find a dentist. Uh, these, both of these boys, by the way, are black, and they're both about 15 years old. We really need help from the public on this one, to, uh, on these two cases. To... Relatives of Smith have eliminated one of the bodies as a possibility. But Dr. Figo says there are still further checks on the other. Police ask us to repeat that they'd like to hear from you if you have any idea who the two bodies may have been. Don McClellan, Action News. The next victim, 14-year-old Milton Harvey, disappeared while running an errand to the bank for his mother. He was riding his bike, which was found a week later in a remote area of Atlanta. His body was not recovered until November of that year. On October 21st, nine-year-old Yusa Bell went to the grocery store for his neighbor on McDaniel Street. A witness saw Yusa near the intersection of McDaniel and Fulton get into a blue car before he disappeared. His body was found on November 8th in an abandoned E.P. Johnson Elementary School by a school janitor who was looking for a place to use the restroom. Bill's body was found clothed in the brown cutoff shorts he was last seen wearing. Though they had a piece of masking tape stuck to his mouth, he had been hit over the head and caused the death with strangulation. Police did not immediately link his disappearance to the previous killings.
It's not how long you live, but how well. That's what Reverend B.J. Johnson told the people who filled the church on Glen Street. And everybody agreed that Yusef Bell had lived very well indeed. Not materially, but spiritually. His intelligence, his love of life, his abilities were praised as gifts of God. And God had taken Yusef back. There was no other explanation for his brutal, unsolved murder, but there was hope. For a little child shall lead them. And it is my hope at this particular point that the conscience of this city, the conscience of this community, the conscience of this nation will be touched, will be penetrated by the life and by the death of this young man. A lot of tears were shed for this little nine-year-old leader, despite suggestions that this was not a time for sadness. But we come by today not to cry. We come by today not to drop and droop and not to be broken, but we come by today to thank God for yourself. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. That's all. That's all we're here for. There have been many sad moments in this year of crime in Atlanta. This was one of the saddest, but also one of the most inspiring. Paul Miller, Action News. On March 4, 1980, the first female victim, 12-year-old Angel Lanier, she left her house around 4 p.m. wearing a denim outfit and was last seen at her friend's house watching a television program. Lanier's body was found six days later in a wooded vacant lot along Campleton Road, wearing the same clothes in which she left her home in, a pair of white panties that did not belong to her, stuffed in her mouth, and her hands were bounded with the electrical cord. The cause of death was strangulation. On March 11th, one week after Lanier's disappearance, 11-year-old Jeffrey Mattis disappeared while running an errand for his mother. He was wearing gray jogging pants, brown shoes, and a white and green shirt. Months later, a girl said he saw him get into a blue car with a light-skinned man and a dark-skinned man. The body of Jeffrey Mattis was later recovered in a wooded area 11 months after he disappeared, by which at the time it was not possible to identify the cause of death. On June 9, 12 year old Christopher Richardson went missing on his way to a local pool. He was last seen walking towards the DeKalb County's Midway Recreation Center. He was wearing blue shorts, a light blue shirt, and blue tennis shoes. His body was not found until the following January clothed in unfamiliar swim trunks along with the body of later victim Earl Terrell. The cause of death was not determined. Today's response was overwhelming. More than 2,000 people showed up. It was a gesture that didn't go unnoticed by Mayor Jackson. And you represent a parallel story. One story is the tragedy that is afflicting our children. And the other story is your response in this time of adversity. You have come together. You're responding in a way that I don't believe ever has been seen in any city in the history of this country. This week, searchers were in the East Lake Meadows area. This squadron of Marines checks a nearby creek. Their objective, to find clues leading to the disappearance of 11-year-old Christopher Richardson and 10-year-old Darren Glass, both of the East Lake Meadows area. Stay to your left. Don't come up through here now. Stay where you left. The searchers left no stone unturned, often going into very treacherous areas, but discovering nothing more than false leads. Still, they were determined to keep the search alive. If there's something here, you want to find it. And if there's nothing here, we'll just go to the next search site next week and try there. But we're going to keep going until we find something. Most of the searchers headed back to their rallying point at around 2 this afternoon with nothing more to show for their hard work but a new sense of community.
This is my community now, and I, I care what happens, and it's, I feel it's part of my commitment to, um, to Atlanta. Bob Moore, Action News. On June 22nd, seven-year-old Latanya Wilson disappeared from her parents' apartment. According to a witness, she appeared to be kidnapped by two men, one of whom was seen climbing into the apartment window and then holding Wilson in his arms as he spoke to the other man in the parking lot. On October 18th, Wilson's body was found in a fence area at the end of Verbena Street in Atlanta. By then, the body had been skeletonized, and no cause of death could be determined. Six-year-old Latanya Wilson is still missing from her home. She was kidnapped during the early morning. When her mother checked around 1 a.m., Latanya was in bed with her sister, safe and sound. Later that morning, she was gone. Someone broke into the apartment, singled out Latanya, took her, and left the other children alone. Both the mother and father were in another room of the apartment when the child was taken. Police are still searching for Latanya. In the meantime, Mrs. Ella Wilson is pleading for her child's safe return. I just want my little girl found safely and brought home. I miss her and I love her. <laughs> I want her. From Dixie Hills, Bob Moore, Action News. The next day, June 23rd, 10 year old Aaron Wish disappeared after being seen near a local grocery store getting into a blue Chevrolet with either one or two black men. A female witness says she saw Wish being led from Tanya's grocery store by a six foot tall, 180 pound black male, about 30 years old, with a mustache and goatee. The witness's description of the car matched a description of a similar car implicated in the earlier Jeffrey Mathis disappearance. At 9 p.m., Wish was seen at a shopping center. The following day, Wish's body was found under a bridge. The official cause of death was asphyxiation from a broken neck suffered in a fall. Ten-year-old Aaron Darnell Weich died of asphyxiation last June, and for all this time, the DeKalb medical examiner said his death was an accident. Weich's body was found in the early morning of June 24th, here over the train trestle at Moreland Avenue and Constitution Road. At the time, they thought he accidentally fell off. Now DeKalb police officials have changed their minds. They think it was murder, and they have reopened the case. But DeKalb police do know something now that they did not know last June. There was evidence found on Weich's body that links his death to some of the other murdered Atlanta children. But DeKalb would not say what that evidence is. Although there is no new medical evidence, DeKalb Public Safety Director DeKalb now believes the marks on the back of Weich's neck may have meant there was a struggle. That in this particular case, there may have been an attempt by the Weich subject to actually get away from the person who was holding him captive. We don't know. That is some speculation that he may have attempted to run away, climbed on the bridge, and fell from the bridge at that time. Aaron's mother says she's glad they are finally investigating her son's death as a homicide. She never believed it was an accident. For one thing, he was scared of height, and he wouldn't have been up on that bridge in the first place, and they were too far from home for him to be. And he never went down there. The day before Aaron died, he was here at the Winn-Dixie at Moreland Center, carrying grocery bags to cars for elderly people. It was his way of making some extra money. That, too, fits the description of many of the other children. But how he got from here to the train trestle several miles away, police don't know. DeKalb police have asked Atlanta to include Aaron's name as number 19 on the missing and murdered children's list, but so far the task force hasn't done it. Lynn Harrison, Action News. In July 1980, two more children were found murdered, 9-year-old Anthony Carter and 10-year-old Earl Terrell. 13-year-old Clifford Jones disappeared on August 20th. He was found dead from strangulation. His body was found August 21st behind a dumpster in the, of the former Hollywood Plaza shopping center. At 1 o'clock this morning, police received an anonymous phone call. The caller said a body could be found behind the Hollywood Plaza shopping center at Hollywood Road and Perry Boulevard. When police checked it out, they found the caller was right. 13-year-old Clifford Jones, who had been missing from his home since noon yesterday, was found dead alongside a dumpster. He had apparently been strangled. 
This was the second time an anonymous phone tip had led police to the body of a murdered child. And now police are sounding more and more as if they believe at least some of these cases are related. We are unable to say categorically that there's a relationship between one case and the other. The fact that we have the case, and there are some similarities, obviously. All of the cases involve young black people under the age of 15. The method under which they were killed in terms of the homicides involves some similarities. So as a matter uh, of investigation and addressing the cases, we have to make certain assumptions. One of the assumptions, obviously, we have to look at the possibility that there may be some connection between all of the cases. We're not discounting that, but it, our response has to be based on what we know. The 10 murders and kidnappings involving missing children have become priority number one at APD. The task force assigned to investigate the cases has been doubled in size to 10. The FBI has been asked to assign two of its agents to assist in the investigation. Governor Busby will be asked to loan Atlanta police four agents from the GBI. The state will also be asked to provide money to pay for extra police overtime and other expenses. Top police officials are convinced that they are doing everything that is humanly possible to try and solve these cases. And still, the murders and the kidnappings continue. The only way to describe the atmosphere here today is one of frustration. From Atlanta Police Headquarters, Dennis Cow, Action News. 12-year-old Charles Stevens was reported missing on October 9th. His body was found the next day on Norman Berry Drive near the entrance to a trailer park. Stevens' body was missing his t-shirt and one of his shoes. He remained wearing his dark blue pants. Police determined the cause of death was asphyxiation. Blood marks were identified on his nose and mouth. The state considered this a pattern case in Williams' trial. Police say the body of Charles Stevens was left where it could easily be found. And in that way, they say, there's a similarity to a case in August. And like some of the other cases, Stevens was not missing very long. In this case, it was only a little more than 12 hours from the time he left his mother's apartment on Prior Circle until his body was found. The last time Charles Stevens was seen alive by anyone who knew him was about 5 o'clock yesterday when he went to this grocery store just down the hill from where he lived. At midnight, his mother reported him missing. Less than eight hours later, he was dead. Once again, the question has come up, is this case related to the others? Again, the answer is maybe. Police say they have some evidence in this case that they don't want to discuss, but say that does not mean that they are any more optimistic about solving this case. During a news conference at police headquarters, the frustration of the police was obvious. A task force is working around the clock on these cases, but no arrests have been made. Public Safety Commissioner Brown says this is not the time to look for people to blame for that. We can't start pointing fingers and become divisive as a community. What we have to do is recognize that we have a concern that impacts on all of our citizens and join forces in an effort to address this concern in any way that's humanly possible. Brown again urged people to report anything suspicious to police. The reward money is now up to $20,000, but police are not relying only on citizen tips. While denying that the situation is beyond their control, police plan to bring a New Jersey psychic to Atlanta next week. Paul Miller, Action News. Nine-year-old Aaron Jackson went missing on November 1st. His body was later discovered the next day strangled, lying face up on a river bank. Shortly before 3 o'clock, a man taking a Sunday afternoon walk found the body. The child wore blue jeans, a printed shirt, and sneakers without socks. He was lying face up on the river bank near a bridge on Forest Park Road. There were no obvious marks of violence on the body. It was almost as if someone had carefully placed him there. Within minutes of the discovery, the normally desolate area resembled a police parking lot. Homicide detectives and members of the special task force on missing and murdered children combed the area for clues. Workers from a nearby auto body shop who had called police had casts made of their footprints so that they might be compared with footprints police found on the muddy bank. The man who found the body had his footprints taken too, but he was skeptical that the clue might lead to the killer or killers of at least 10 other Atlanta children. The way I see it, they ain't gonna catch him. Police were not talking about any clues they might have found. They wouldn't say if the boy matched the description of any of the four children still missing. Police Commissioner Lee Brown made a brief statement. Upon arrival of the police, we found that there was in fact a black male 
body that was laying next to the river. The person appears to be between the ages of 12 and 13 years of age. At this time, that's all the information we have about the person. He is now in custody of the Fulton County Medical Examiner where the investigation is underway to determine the cause of death and also the identity of the person. Is this being added to the list of cases for the task force? Well, our task force is here on the scene. We are at this point waiting until we can determine from the medical examiner exactly what we do have in terms of the person's identity as well as the cause of death. Police say the body had been on the bank no more than 24 hours. An autopsy is scheduled Monday morning to determine how the little boy died. The case has only deepened the frustration police feel after months of investigation into crimes against children has produced no solid leads. There is frustration, too, that after weeks of warning parents not to let their children go out alone, another child has died alone. His body found in a neighborhood where there are few people. Ernie Bjorkman visited the area tonight. 60-year-old Patrick Rogers knew several of the previous victims. He went missing on November 30th. His body was later found December 7th in a river. Police speculated that he dropped from the bridge above. In 1981, the murders continued. The first known victim in the new year was 14-year-old Luby Gitter. He disappeared on January 3rd. Gitter's body was found on February 5th. For the second straight day, investigators were literally beating the bushes looking for any trace of 14-year-old Chuck Jeter. The little boy disappeared Saturday from the Stewart Lakewood Mall in southwest Atlanta. Trained dogs sniffed the area around the mall today, but turned up nothing. This weekend, volunteer searchers will be on the lookout for Jeter, but police say so far they're stumped. This latest disappearance has once again sent a wave of fear throughout the black community. Tonight, frightened parents met to talk about what to do. They want more neighborhood patrols, more police protection, and a tougher curfew than the city has now. Come go to City Hall with us and bring that curfew down to 8 o'clock. And 8 o'clock too late for any kids to be out. But despite the curfew, despite the neighborhood meetings and the patrols and the intense investigation by the task force, there are now 16 missing or murdered children in Atlanta, 16 missing or murdered children, but no arrests. At first, investigators thought the killings might be the work of one person, but now they're not so sure. It is possible that six of the murders might be related because the cases do have striking similarities. But there is also the disturbing theory that family members might be responsible for some of the killings. At least two fathers have repeatedly failed lie detector tests, and the FBI is questioning most of the parents. Some of the children may have been killed in street violence, and of course, some may be runaways. But the fact remains, no one has given enough information in any of these categories to make an arrest, and until they do, the fear remains. Ten-year-old Terry Pugh went missing in January. An unknown caller called the police where to find Pugh's body. Terry lived in the same apartment as Edward Terry Smith, who was killed in 1979. Terry Pugh's body was found here. Sigmund Road, though, is a long way from where he lived. So police believe his body was dumped here Friday morning after someone abducted the 15-year-old at a bus stop. Information we have received that the child was last seen at approximately 3 o'clock Wednesday afternoon at a bus stop on Hollywood Court. And he was going supposedly en route to East Point to play basketball of the East Point area. Rockdale authorities also confirmed our report that Terry Pugh had not been on the missing persons list. Apparently, the child had been in the habit of leaving home for days at a time, and his family thought this time he would return as usual. But today, the grieving Pugh family would not talk to reporters. Detectives who had questioned the family said they were in no condition to talk. Neighbors said the Pews were new to the neighborhood, and one said she had paid the family a condolence visit. I was just telling her um, the community would like to have her, and she was in a lot of grief, and uh, she was just upset because the child was gone, and she said he was a good child. Though the body was found in neighboring Rockdale County, the murder of Terry Pugh has been added to the assignments of the Atlanta Missing Children's Task Force. Authorities say there are similarities with other incidents. Like four of the other children, Pugh had been strangled.
Hank Phillippe, Action News. In February and March of 1981, six more bodies were discovered, believed to be linked to the previous homicides. Among the deceased was the body of 21-year-old Eddie Duncan, the first adult victim. The body was discovered in mid-afternoon Monday by two people boating on the Chattahoochee. Officials from the Fulton County and Atlanta Police Departments, the GBI, and the Special Task Force immediately rushed to the scene near Cochrane Road. Four policemen pulled the body from the river around 5 o'clock. It was thought then the body could have been dumped in the river earlier and floated to where it was found. Authorities had some difficulties taking the victim for identification. The site was so tangled that even the ambulance became mired in the mud. All that was known at that point was that the body was of a black teenager, about 5'6", clad only in jockey shorts. When it was brought to the Fulton County Medical Examiner's Office, authorities said the identification would have to be made from dental records. Reportedly, those of the missing Darren Glass were already in the doctor's possession. Joseph Bells were called for, and today we have learned also those of Timothy Hill, who was not on the task force list. State crime lab workers stayed at the medical examiner's office for two hours late last night. They were the first to examine the body and wanted to remove any evidence or fibers that might be present. No report yet on what, if anything, was found. The lab workers stayed there till after midnight. In April of 1981, 20-year-old Larry Rogers, 28-year-old John Porter, and 21-year-old Jimmy Ray Payne were murdered. Porter and Payne were ex-convicts and had just recently been released from prison after serving time for burglary. Until this month, all but one of the children's bodies had been found outside. But then on April 9th, police checking out a tip about an abandoned car found Larry Rogers' body in this old apartment building right in the heart of the city. So now abandoned apartment buildings join isolated wooded areas as places to look for dumped bodies. And that's what brings Blair Village into the picture. This complex has about 1,100 units, more than 800 of them, are abandoned. In the words of the Saturday searchers, the perfect place to look, the perfect place to pull in, drop off a body, and leave without anyone seeing you. Hi. So today, Blair Village is a target of the Saturday search, and they have a job cut out for them. There are more abandoned apartments here than any place else inside Atlanta's city limits. So when police asked the searchers to work on abandoned apartments, this was a logical place to start. The goal today is to check every one of these apartments for bodies and any other evidence they might find. This is nowhere close to the biggest crowd to search, about 150 in all. But leaders say it's pretty good for Easter weekend. They aren't disappointed in the crowd and they aren't disappointed in their results. They believe that much of what they find is really helpful to the police and maybe even more valuable than the release these searchers give to the people who participate in them. Gary Reeves, Action News. John Porter, a 28-year-old small frame black man, was found stabbed to death last April, here in a vacant lot in southwest Atlanta. Task force officials inspected the scene and body, but Porter was never added to their list. Although he fit most of the characteristics, he had been stabbed, not a familiar pattern. But a month later, the 27th murder victim, William Barrett, would be found with puncture wounds in his stomach. Porter, though, remained just another homicide victim. However, today in court, his name was resurrected. An assistant district attorney, during a motions hearing, informed the judge that the state had supplied the defense with information on seven other cases, cases that investigators say appear to be linked. Patrick Baltazar, Patrick Rogers, Terry Pugh, Eddie Duncan, Larry Rogers, Timothy Hill, and finally, John Porter indicating his death is connected to the others. Sources say it wasn't so much the fibers found on Porter's body, but his blood type, B, a type found in Wayne Williams' car. It's now possible that the state will introduce these seven cases, including Porter's, to show the jury a pattern of killings, all committed, it claims, by the suspect. Ernie Bjorkman, Action News. Police, FBI and GBI agents and members of the special task force converged on the river from the Cobb County side. Rescue teams brought in boats that would be needed to retrieve the body from the river, 12 to 15 feet from the bank of the Fulton County side. It had been a summer-like afternoon and many people were fishing in the river. 23-year-old Tony Gibbs was at his favorite fishing spot when he saw something float by and stick in the weeds. Well, it did kind of upset me. I'd never seen a body before. 
in the river. While Gibbs ran to call police, 13-year-old Jesse Grimes got a close-up look at the body. Then I went down there, it was in the weeds. It was still laying there, hooked on some weeds. And it has red shorts on, and that's it. That's all it had on. Although the body was recovered in Fulton County, Deputy Atlanta Police Director Morris Redding said the task force was in charge of the scene. All we can say at this time, we got a body out of the river, and it's a black male. That's the only comment we have to say at this time. The body is on the way to the medical examiner. We'll try to have you something later on. Which Thank medical? you. This discovery only heightens concern over the increasing frequency with which the bodies are being found. This is the sixth body of a young black man to be found within the past month and the eighth body to be found in or near a river. Eyewitnesses said the body appeared to be bloated, but police said they would wait for an opinion from the Fulton County Medical Examiner before saying whether this death will be added to the task force list. For Good Morning Atlanta, this is Terry Anzer. On May 12th of 1981, FBI agents found the body of 17-year-old William Billy Star Barrett on a curb in a wooded area near his home. A custodian from the Southwest High School had run out of gas about a mile from the scene. Wood described a black man standing over and observing the location where the body was found before driving away in a white over blue Cadillac. Sources close to this case say Barrett was apparently stabbed two times with a sharp object in the stomach after he was strangled. The puncture wounds, they say, did not cause death. DeKalb's public safety director, sensitive about such findings, would not comment on the report. The wounds not found on any other victim were probably the major reason why Barrett was not placed with the task force yesterday. But today, the state crime lab produced something called trace evidence for DeKalb investigators. It could be anything from hairs to certain fibers found on either the body or the clothes. That evidence apparently matched evidence found on other victims, proof enough that there is some connection. Based solely on certain items of trace evidence, there appears to be some connection. I cannot categorically say that they are the same. And I think the only time we will ever make that final connection is once we do apprehend a suspect. With proof of a possible connection, the task force must now retrace the teenager's movements on the day he died, which was Monday. It is known Barrett ran an errand for his mother, leaving his house on 2nd Avenue in DeKalb County and coming here into Atlanta on McDaniel Street. That was around 1 in the afternoon. Police have now learned that Barrett was probably last seen in this area, the Kirkwood area of DeKalb County, around 5 o'clock on Monday afternoon. According to the medical examiner, that was probably only hours before the teenager was murdered. Investigators think Barrett was killed sometime between 6 and 9 o'clock on Monday night. Director Han says Barrett's murder was very similar to that of Patrick Baltazar's, dumped behind Corporate Square in February. It was that case, the first for the cab, that led investigators into the sex ring theory. Han says his people will again be looking into that theory to see if this latest victim fits into it. Ernie B. Orkman, Action News. During the end of May of 1981, the last reported victim was added to the list, 27-year-old Nathaniel Cater. He was seen by a witness holding hands with Wayne Williams at a local movie theater in Atlanta, Georgia. His body was discovered two days later. Cater's last known address was 2261 Verbena Street in northwest Atlanta. We don't know when he was last seen alive. He was found Sunday in the Chattahoochee near the I-285 bridge. He had been dead several days. Cater died just a couple of weeks before his 28th birthday, which makes him by far the oldest victim. But police don't think whoever is killing the young people is now choosing victims at random. Again, we do not believe at this point, based upon what we know, that there is a random picking up of people. If you like. What we have to determine is what is that characteristic that tie everyone together, the ones, everyone being those who have been come, become victims. What is the common characteristic? Brown would not say, but Cater breaks the pattern in more than one way. He was not retarded or slow as the other adult victims were. Cater's case breaks the pattern in another way. The police did not release his name right away. Since he had not been reported missing, they thought it might help to delay releasing the name. We made a decision because there was a necessity for two things. One, a continuous verification, and also for some preliminary investigative activities that we 
uh, made the decision to make the name known today. Brown would not say if delaying release of the name had done any good. Paul Miller, Action News. With the slaying of Nathaniel Cater, this eventually led the Doherty's to the only man who, to date, has been convicted of any of the killings, Wayne Williams. Wayne Bertram Williams was born May 27, 1958, and raised in the Dixie Hills neighborhood of Atlanta, Georgia, the only son of teachers Homer and Faye Williams. This is Mark Picard. Cobb County's disposition of the Patrick Rogers case is an uncomfortable reminder that loose ends remain from the investigation into the murders of young Atlantans. It is particularly significant on this day. For one year ago, June 21, 1981, the man now convicted of two of those murders, Wayne Williams, was arrested. His arrest brought to a close an investigation that seemed to progress for many months in fits and starts. A year after the first bodies were found, Atlanta formed a special task force in July of 1980 to investigate the growing number of murders. That task force grew to become one of the largest single-purpose crime-fighting efforts in American history. The community responded to the tragedy in mostly positive ways. On October 18, 1980, the first of many Saturday searches was organized. Private citizens from Atlanta and around the country chipped in with the searches, with efforts to raise money, and protecting children in the community. There was no sense of progress, only frustration, as more bodies were discovered. Then in February of 1981, it was disclosed that the state crime lab was looking at trace evidence, fibers, and animal hairs as possible links between victims and killer. It was a link that put the investigation on the right track. The bodies kept turning up with frightening regularity. On May 24, 1981, the body of Nathaniel Cater was taken from the Chattahoochee River. It was the last body found. Then a dramatic development. On June 3, 1981, the task force executed a search warrant at a house on Penelope Street in northwest Atlanta. The search, we were told, was connected with the death of Nathaniel Cater and the possibility that his body was thrown into the river from a bridge. And on June 21, 1981, after weeks of surveillance on the Penelope Street house, police arrested Wayne Bertram Williams. That fiber evidence led to his conviction on two counts of murder. His attorney, Lynn Watley, is working to overturn that conviction. His parents maintain their son's innocence. He's wondering why the real killers or suspects that they had have not been apprehended. He still maintains his interests and say he has never killed or harmed a person. And considering he's been confined one year ago today, he's in, he's in good spirits. Attorney Watley told reporters his investigation has uncovered some information which could have a bearing on the appeals hearing this fall. While attorney Lynn Watley continues to build Wayne Williams' appeal, Williams himself is settling into a routine inside the Fulton County Jail. He is reading, he is writing letters, and he is writing his diary. One year after his arrest, especially with these latest developments from Cobb County, there is still the feeling that Wayne Williams' story, whatever it may be, is still not complete. From the Fulton County Jail, Mark Picard, Action News. With an above average IQ and honors, he graduated from Frederick Douglass High School. Later, he went to Georgia State University for a while before dropping out to pursue a career in entrepreneurship. At a young age, Wayne had dreamed of making it into the entertainment and broadcasting industry. He was talented in mechanic and electronics. At 16, he established his own amateur radio station called Raz. However, due to Wayne's bad management, the radio station had to eventually close. Wayne's family and the Southwest Communication Systems filed for bankruptcy. Eventually, Williams, in his late teens, worked at a part-time radio station. By 1976, Williams reinvented himself as a talent agent, claiming to have contacts with the Atlanta radio and music scenes. He was primarily interested in young boys, which he later claimed was because he was attempting to replicate the success of the Jackson 5. At the time of his arrest, he was searching for talents for his group called Gemini. He had printed hundreds of flyers that he distributed in arcades, skating rinks, and shopping malls. All the while, as means to sustain himself, he worked as a freelance accident scene photographer. Listening at night to the police scanner, he had stalled in his car, 
to get first on the scenes of arsons, murders, and other incidents. As for his personality, Williams was known by others as a pathological liar, always exaggerating details of his career, such as knowing important people or having the right contacts in the entertainment industry. He was also obsessed with the police and had reportedly learned how to impersonate a cop. In 1976, he went as far as to illegally equip his police-like sedan with red and blue lights. As a result, he was arrested for impersonating a police officer. He was also said to threaten and arrest children who hung out on the streets, whom he claimed were job shots, a slang term referring to useless and worthless people who only deserve to be shot down. Williams first came to police's attention in the early hours of May 22, 1981, two days before the body of Nate Daniel Cater was retrieved from the Chattahoochee River. Freddie Jacobs and Bob Campbell was stationed near the James Jackson Parkway Bridge, which crossed the river where some of the victims had been found, as well as the line between two counties. Just after Jacob saw a car that identified as a white 1970 Chevrolet station wagon cross the bridge, Campbell, who was beneath the bridge, heard a loud splash and saw the water ripple. Campbell then radioed an FBI agent who pulled over the car, which was driven by Williams. Williams told the police he was on his way to a potential client named Cheryl Johnson. Though she was nowhere to be found, and the phone number and address to which Williams said she lived turned out to be fake. However, while Wayne Williams was being questioned, authorities couldn't find a body. As a result, they had to let him go. However, Nate Daniels Cater's body was eventually found. Though the medical examiner couldn't determine exact time of death, he stated that Cater's body had been dead long enough to have been dropped from the bridge on the night in question. Later, some witnesses claimed to have seen him alive in the days between the May 21st and May 24th. Though their statements were made public, the investigators obtained a search warrant for Williams' home, car, and dog to get fiber samples to compare fibers found on the victims and brought him in for questioning. When the police looked into his whereabouts for the afternoon of May 21st, they couldn't confirm the story he gave them. They also put him through three polygraph tests, all of which he failed. Williams still maintained his innocence and even held a press conference outside of his home. Things began to get interesting around 9.30 last night when the FBI agents and the representative of the special task force emerged from a house in northwest Atlanta. They had executed a court-approved search warrant and came away with items they hoped to link with evidence collected at some of the crime scenes. Things like purple and yellow cloth, a piece of yellow blanket, a piece of green carpet fiber, purple thread, and dog hairs. We soon learned that the 23-year-old man who lived with his parents in the house had been taken into custody by the FBI around three Wednesday afternoon. After 12 hours of interrogation, Public Safety Commissioner Lee Brown told waiting reporters that the man had been released and no arrest made. What the reporters on hand did not know was that Brown was creating a diversion for the man and his father to leave the building. While they may have left relatively undetected, they were met by a crowd of reporters at their home. I had been invited inside by the man's mother and spoke to the family about the ordeal and the questions of guilt or innocence that were being raised. At 7 a.m., three and a half hours after returning home, the young man conducted a news conference, setting the condition that he would not be shown and that his name not be used. You will hear him, but you will see reporters and photographers. He contended that he was being harassed prior to his detainment, intimidated during his custody, and pressured to confess to crimes he says he did not commit. They openly said, you killed Nathaniel Cater, and you know it, and you're lying to us. They said that. And they said it on a number of occasions. They said it on that night. Uh, one of the task force captains on the scene pointed his finger at me and said it, and said he was tired of all the uh, BS about working the long hours, working the stakeouts, and that he was ready to pull the thing to an end. The man admits to voluntarily taking a polygraph test and, according to the examiner, answering key questions deceptively. But he contends he did not fail it. The man is free. No arrests have been made. But he expects to be kept under surveillance at least until the state crime lab processes the new evidence. This man is not standing still. He is considering a suit against law enforcement officials for mistreatment 
and against certain news organizations for disclosing his name. Mark Picard, Action News, tonight. During the following weeks, the FBI forensic labs matched fiber samples found on the victims to samples from Williams' environment and witnesses who claimed to have seen Williams with various victims and who had claimed to have seen cuts and scratches on his arms. On June 21st, Williams was arrested for the murders of Nate Daniel Cater and Jimmy Payne. Williams' trial began on January 6, 1982. During the two-month trial, prosecutors matched to a number of victims 19 sources of fibers from Williams' home and car. Other evidence included witnesses' testimonies that placed Williams with several victims while they were still alive and inconsistencies in his accounts of his whereabouts. Eventually, Williams took the stand in his own defense, but alienated the jury by becoming angry and combative. Assistant District Attorney Jack Mallard let loose early, asking Williams why he named his singing group Gemini. Williams denied choosing the name. Mallard continued, however, asking, doesn't it mean two people, dual personalities, a Jekyll and Hyde, hinting to the jury that this man on the stand lived two lives, one of them as a killer. The attorney then brought up the addresses of several friends where Williams would visit. Their homes, he said, ironically, were all very close to where several victims had been dumped. The suspect said he never thought of that. Earlier, Williams had bluntly stated the police version of the now famous bridge incident was wrong. A lie. He claimed he wasn't driving slow, that he didn't turn around in a parking lot next to the bridge, that he did not throw anything into the river. Mallard, are the police mistaken or are you lying? Williams, I'm up here on trial for my life, sir, so I wouldn't be telling lies. Mallard, wouldn't you? Isn't that a pretty good reason to lie? Williams, look, Mr. Mallard, if I had killed anyone, I would have told you by now. The day went like that, sharp exchanges between the accused and the prosecutor. Many times, Mallard attempting to catch Williams in a lie. However, the suspect would either deny saying something or claim someone else lied. He tried to persuade the jury he really was out near a bridge that night looking for a Cheryl Johnson who still remains a mystery to this trial. The state implied he fabricated the story, but Williams didn't budge from it, claiming the woman simply gave him a wrong number and wrong address. The suspect refuted testimony from a number of state witnesses who earlier placed him with several victims and claimed he had made homosexual advances. Williams gave reasons to the jury why many of them would want to implicate him in the murders. He then denied ever being at victim Terry Pugh's funeral. Mallard, however, kept coming back and coming back to the night of the bridge incident and the woman he was attempting to contact, hoping the 23-year-old talent agent would break down and change a fact here or there. At times, it appeared the prosecutor succeeded, but other times, it appeared Williams explained his way out of it. Mallard ended on a dramatic note tonight. Mr. Williams, he asked, isn't it true you got scratches on your face and arms from the victims as you were choking the life out of them? No, said the suspect. I'm as guilty as you are, Mr. Mallard. And I'm not so sure this thing is over. Court was recessed for the day. After 12 hours of deliberation, the jury found him guilty on February 27th of the murders of Cater and Payne. He was sentenced to life imprisonment. After Williams became a suspect, the killing stopped. Forever. That he is innocent. That's the bottom line. He's innocent. What? Not only do I feel he's innocent, but if if uh, the prosecuting team had to make one last statement before they die, and that statement would cause them to go to heaven or hell, they would say he's innocent. But the 12 members of the jury thought otherwise, and when Wayne Williams was escorted from the Fulton County Courthouse last night, it was no longer as a suspect, but a convicted killer. Williams accepted the verdict with the same composure he maintained throughout most of the trial. He told the court, I just hope the person or persons who've committed these crimes can be brought to justice. I, more than anyone, want to see this terror ended, but I did not do it. It took the jury only 11 hours to reach their decision. Wayne Williams guilty of the murders of 27-year-old Nathaniel Cater and 21-year-old Jimmy Ray Payne. The quick verdict surprised everyone. After all, the jury sat through nine weeks of testimony, heard 197 witnesses. The prosecution, led by District Attorney Lewis Slayton, presented a mountain of circumstantial evidence, and it paid off. I did say jigsaw puzzle, and I did say we'd put uh, the pieces there where they could see the big picture. Uh, that meant it took a lot of uh, pieces, and uh, I, I don't uh, describe any of them as uh, stronger or weaker what than the What about the, the fiber? No one actually saw Wayne Williams stop his car on the bridge over the Chattahoochee last May. 
No one saw him dump the body of Nathaniel Cater over the rail and into the water. But two days after he was seen driving slowly over the bridge, Cater's body was found in the river. Nine days earlier, Jimmy Ray Payne's body was found in about the same location. But the most convincing circumstantial evidence, the fibers and dog hairs found in William's car and home. They matched fibers found on the bodies of the victims. Fiber evidence was the uh, hardest evidence to overcome. Uh, I don't know of anything else that I would have done differently than what we did. The defense team announced immediately William's convictions would be appealed. It's expected to center on Judge Cooper's ruling allowing evidence that linked Williams with the killings of 10 other child murder victims. That evidence enabled the prosecution to establish a pattern involving the defendant. The major ground, of course, the most outstanding would be the allowance of the pattern. Um, I think that we were put in a position where we were charged with two crimes and then called upon to defend 12. And with the uh, inadequate resources, the inadequate time, um, there was just no way for Wayne Williams or anyone, for that matter, to defend um, defend against 12 uh, crimes uh, without proper preparation. Wayne Williams was found guilty and sentenced to two consecutive life terms. But there are 26 child murder cases still unsolved. What happens now? It would appear the task force may be disbanded within the next few days. Police sources now claim they believe Williams committed all but two of those murders. But there are those in the community who will wonder. After all, there seem to be many in Atlanta who don't believe the guilt of Wayne Williams was proven beyond a reasonable doubt. It would then follow that a lot of people still think the killer of Atlanta's children remains free. Still maintaining his innocence, Williams has spent the past decades fighting his conviction and trying to get a retrial while serving his sentence at Hancock State Prison. He has claimed that the investigators covered up evidence of KKK involvement in order to prevent a race war. The claim may have some credence since Charles T. Sanders, a white supremacist affiliated with the Klan, it was revealed in 2006, praised the killings and secretly recorded conversations. Sanders had also threatened to strangle one of the younger victims, Luby Gitter, because of a personal dispute. Though Gitter was indeed strangled, Sanders was not investigated as a suspect. Other theories included that there were multiple killers. In his book, Mindhunter, which was published in 1995, profiler John Douglas stated that Williams probably committed 11 other Atlanta child murders, but added there were no strong evidence connecting him to most of the murders. In 2007, attorneys for the state of Georgia allowed Williams' defense to re-examine dog hairs and human scalp hairs found on victim Patrick Baltazar. The testing of the dog hairs was done by the University of California. Since they only had mitochondrial DNA to work with, they couldn't be used to identify a single unique dog as a source. The testing of the human hairs, on the other hand, was carried out by the FBI's lab in Quantico, Virginia. They contain a very unique sequence of DNA that's only present in 29 of the 1,148 African American hair samples in the FBI database and not present in any of the Caucasian and Hispanic samples. Since Williams carries the sequence himself, he remains a suspect. I was probably my own worst enemy. I was a, a arrogant, bus-headed idiot at the time. And I played right into these people's hands. I could see almost the shock in the jurors' faces if they said, my God, is this the same Wayne that was up here yesterday? I could see that. When you got angry with the prosecutor, you said, you're a drop shot. I called him a drop What's shot. What's a drop shot? What's that mean? Quite simply in our vernacular, a drop shot is a guy who's not worth much of anything, <laughs> you know, just drop him and shoot him and get him out of the way. In other words, you're useless. We reminded Wayne that he also called poor black children on the streets the same thing, drop shots. That does not make me a murderer simply because I said somebody is a drop shot or because I called him a drop shot. That does not make Wayne Williams a murderer because I said somebody is a street urchin. You know, come on, we're talking about murder. The fact is I didn't kill anybody.